This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Stick to the end to find out how I have been using Skillshare to help with my productivity issues, of which there are many. Picture this, you are a young woman, happily engaged to the love of your life, who gets a promotion at his big fancy lawyer job and is sent on this huge trip to Transylvania. At the same time, your best, most beautiful friend in the whole world is proposed to three times and gets engaged to one of the men. Things are looking up. Then suddenly your beau's letters get scarcer and your bestie starts getting sick. Wolves escape the zoo. Strange figures are hovering over your very unhappy friend right now and there is a deep evil spreading across London that has something to do with landlords. If this sounds familiar, you might be Mina Murray from Bram Stoker's gothic novel, Dracula. And despite being in a healthy, loving relationship with your boyfriend and being one of the protagonists of the novel, and in many, many ways, the leader of your vampire hunting team, as you will be in the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, the comic, you are often reduced to being the love interest to the very creature who tried to destroy your life. Why is that? I recently sat down to watch 1992's Bram Stoker's Dracula starring Gary Oldman as Dracula and Winona Ryder as Mina. It is a film that is Boku horny. And I do not say this lightly. We need to bring that back. We need that energy back. We used to be a society. The film depicts the character of Mina as the reincarnated wife of Dracula, something that I have seen happen over and over again in multiple adaptations of Dracula, so much so that for a while I forgot that that is not something that happens in the books. Now, mind you, inherently, I don't think of it as an issue. I am definitely part of the monster fucker community. I am down with the sickness. Ooh, ah, 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 ah. That being said, I am interested in the disconnect between the version of Mina that exists in the books and how due to the evolution of Dracula as the uber pop culture vampire, we see a decision in adaptations to turn Dracula into a tragic romantic lead with Mina specifically. Now I'm talking about just these adaptations. So Dracula from Castlevania, this isn't about you, sweetie. You're doing great. The villagers should have left. You keep doing what you're doing. So in order to encompass that, we are going to talk about the OG final girl in Gothic literature, Mina Murray Harker, and discuss the changes to her role and what they say about the evolution of Dracula. And I'm gonna try and do it in under an hour. I am Dracula. Welcome to my house. Enter freely and of your own will. Come freely, go safely, and leave something of the happiness you bring. Dracula sits in a unique space as vampire fiction. It is not the first nor the second significant written in English, but it is the most impactful in terms of how it has crafted our image of the vampire. So much so that Dracula is probably the first name along with Lestat and Edward Cullen that people think of when they imagine a vampire. Your Dracula, the guy, the Count. I am. And you're sure this isn't just some fanboy thing? Because I fought more than a couple pimply, overweight vamps that call themselves Lestat. Before Dracula, the two influential vampire fiction works in English were The Vampire by John William Polidori, which was published in 1819, and is considered the first vampire English story, which has massive shade towards Lord Byron, who inspired the main character and also kind of wrote the first part of it, but you know, whatever, Byron's overrated. Polidori wrote this story in the same summer that Mary Shelley, shout out to her, wrote Frankenstein. And Carmilla by Joseph Shanrin Le Fanu is about a young girl named Laura who is being seduced by a female vampire named Carmilla. Lesbian vampires have been canon since 1872. Never let them tell you that we weren't here. In comparison to Dracula, what is interesting about these older works is that they are much more in line with how Dracula will be later adapted, especially with being a sexual being with some level of 
romantic sensibility that makes them engrossing to the reader and dangerous to their love interest. Lord Ruthven, who is the vampire in The Vampire, is a rake who torments the protagonist by seducing his younger sister. Carmilla has been seducing and entrapping women all over, but in a sad, sapphic, I don't want to do it, but I guess I got to kind of way that ensures that she will always be this dual creature of longing and danger. Dracula is not like that, <laughs> at least not entirely. While Carmilla and Ruthven are beautiful and described as very attractive, Dracula is not. While his brides are called voluptuous, a lot, that is Bram Stoker's, one of his key words is voluptuous. Dracula is depicted as a creepy, hairy dude, like the whole time whose seduction is all magic and hypnosis rather than actually any beauty or charm, which begs the question of why Dracula is more popular and more tied to some of these romantic archetypes when he is not the creator of them. Lord Ruthven is the first sort of like noble aristocrat vampire. You can see a clear tie between him and that element of Lestat. And Carmilla, I would say, has a lot of elements of what you will see with Louis in certain ways and elements of the later reluctant vampire lover. Well, the reason why I think Dracula is more popular is because Bram Stoker had the ability of having published this book in 1897, so close to the turn of the century, to be able to start putting it into the public eye right away. Stoker wrote the first theatrical adaptation of Dracula, which came out before the novel, but allowed him to have the copyright to it. It also happened to come out when mystery and thrillers had really made a resurgence in the mainstream due to the works of Wilkie Collins. So there was a prime area with film coming up and stage plays, and we're in the late Victorian era. So the empire is feeling pretty chill right now. So they want a little bit of excitement. They want a little bit of, you know, a little decadent. But there's also the morality of these stories. In The Vampire, which I know is probably just pronounced The Vampire, but when you put a Y in it, it has to have a little in it. So I'm calling it The Vampire. In The Vampire, the character of Lord Ruthven wins. He kills the protagonist's sister and he's he doesn't feel any remorse. He just wants to go kill chicks, get money, blah, 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 blah. And plus, unlike Carmilla and Dracula, he is depicted as being a British nobleman. Carmilla is very gay and treated very sympathetically in a lot of ways, even though I don't think that was Le Fanu's intention, but we love her anyway. And therefore you have two kind of narratives that do not fit very neatly into the morality of what she would want in a mainstream text. Dracula has a male British Anglican hero in Jonathan who serves as the kind of de facto heroic face of the novel. The villain is this strange foreigner who comes to London to spread his vampirism. He is defeated by a group of people led by some Englishmen who are doing it to honor the death of a English Rose. They come together as a team. They use their intelligence to beat the foreigner. It ends with babies ever after. It is as feel good of a vampire story as you can get, which means that audiences don't have to feel guilty about any of it. And it was also really scary at the time. So, you know, we love a thriller. So Dracula became the first vampire to enter pulp culture in a major way. And with the earliest actually licensed adaptation of it, 1931's Bela Lugosi's Dracula, you see the beginning of multiple trends. Dracula is hot now, actually. Jonathan, what Jonathan? Who cares about Jonathan energy? Mina, congratulations. You are just full on damsel now with some extra empathy for Dracula. Lucy doesn't really exist. Dracula is now the star. Everyone else is flexible. And that means, especially when you only have a story with two women, that if we're gonna give him a romantic angle, one of these girls is gonna have to do it. <laughs> You are blessed in your wife. I would listen to him go on praising Mina for a day. So I simply nodded and stood silent. She is one of God's women, fashioned by his own hand to show us men and other women that there is a heaven where we can enter and that its light can be here on earth. So true, so sweet, so noble, so little an egoist. And that, let me tell you, is much in this age, so skeptical and selfish.
Big praise. <laughs> Mina in the books is an orphan school mistress with a rich blonde bestie in Lucy Westneria and is engaged to Jonathan Harker. She is very capable in the books, if yet in a little bit of a Victorian aligned way. She is traditional in the sense that she like helps nurse Jonathan back to health when he's sick. She takes care of Lucy when she's turning into a vampire. And in a very Donna Noble fashion, it is her secretarial skills that she uses to help keep track of all the notes and entries and journals about Dracula. And when she develops a psychic link to him after Dracula tries to take advantage of her, she is active in helping the men track down Dracula and keep them focused of saying, when we get that little hoe, we go and beat that little hoe. That's her energy the entire thing. And yes, there is a bit of a damsel element to it. But in 2023, I gotta tell you, my feminism does include letting women lie down. I think what's also really clear when you read Dracula is that she really loves Jonathan and Lucy, which is why she is determined to kill Dracula after he is responsible for turning Lucy into a vampire. Mina is admired for her intelligence, her strength by all the men around her and her relationship with Jonathan is one of equals, but that's not what sells the tickets. So instead of the Mina Murray, who is a trained bisexual, and by trained bisexual, you know who they are, you know who you are. They read Master and Commander fan fictions. They are the loudest unproblematic femme gays in the Our Flag Meets Death community. They are nerdy, dorky legends and that's who Mina is. You know, her appeal in the books and what I think is intriguing about her as a modern reader is that despite the ideals of Victorian society being the angel in the home, the woman who protects the hearth and home, we spend so much time seeing how valuable Mina is outside of it. In fact, it is the men not telling her what's going on, which causes her to get bitten by Dracula and risk vampirism in the first place, which proves for the 10,000th time why hiding your superhero identity is a bad plot line. Mina's intellect is important. And yes, she does rally the men to fight. She is sort of like this idea like woman but she is also allowed to be an active player in her own destiny which is why the change of her becoming the reincarnated love interest of Dracula is kind of corny and I hate it and I'll get into that more but I think we're gonna pin it there because to discuss how Mina is changed we also need to discuss the other woman in Dracula why can't they let a girl marry three men or as many as want her and save all this trouble? Along with her bestie, Lucy is the only major female character in Dracula and therefore gets pushed into stereotypical cliches when adapted. The most common of it is that they make her more sexual and sexually wanton than Mina. In the book, Lucy has three suitors, John Stewart, who's a doctor, Quincy, who's a Texan. His whole personality is that he's from Texas and he loves guns. He's very USA, blah, blah, blah. You can't beat me because I'm an American. And Arthur, who is the Lord, who was played by Carrie Elways in the Bram Stoker's Dracula, which only emphasized that Lucy was getting it. Legend. But it's not because she's sexually forward or anything like that. It's because she is the idealistic ingenue. She is sweet. She is pure. She is kind. She is loving. She wishes that she could marry all three of them because of how much she cares for them and wants them to be all together. Something that even the men are aware of. But despite that aspect of her character, she's often hypersexualized due to, in many ways, the sexualized manner of her death and the way in which female vampires in the book are portrayed as being more sexual. When we see the three sisters slash brides, it's all about how voluptuous they are, how red their mouths are, and how, you know, all of that shit. And it's like, girl, we get Bram. Bram. We get it. And many people have read the staking of Lucy as very subtextual of an essay situation. Uh, I remember in one essay in my Norton anthology said it's the only orgasm in the book. And I was just like, yikes. Arthur took the stake and the hammer 
And when once his mind was set on action, his hands never trembled nor even quivered. Van Helsing opened his missile and began to read, and Quincy and I followed as well as we could. Arthur placed the point over the heart, and as I looked, I could see its dint in the white flesh. Then he struck with all his might. The thing in the coffin withered, and a hideous blood-curling screech came from the opened red lips. The body shook and quivered and twisted in wild contortions the sharp white teeth clamped together till the lips were cut and the mouth was smeared with a crimson foam but arthur never faltered he looked like a figure of thor as his untrembling arm rose and fell driving deeper and deeper the mercy bearing stake whilst the blood from the pierced heart swelled and spurred up around it his face was set and high duty seemed to shine through it the sight of it gave us courage so that our voices seemed to ring through the little vault and then the withering and quivering of the body became less and the teeth seemed to champ and the face to quiver god he said quiver a lot finally it laid still the terrible task was over when lucy is bitten she begins to be more sexually forward she also becomes the boofer woman and is killing children and eating babies and it's a complete transformation from who she is at the beginning and that turn from an innocent to a baby eating vampire is supposed to show us how severe the transformation is it's not just growing fangs and you know becoming voluptuous but it is a transformation a warping of the soul that is inherent to vampirism lucy's death is a moment of mobilization for the cast which is why her being underwritten or hypersexualized in really corny ways can be frustrating i'm not opposed to all of it because i think that she can be you know pure and poly i hate the fact that because she's polyamorous coded it's probably why the sexy lucy thing exists when it's not what that's about but regardless we're supposed to feel her death as an immense loss and tragedy for her as a character and we mourn the goodness that she brought in and rather than expand upon that, she is given either a personality overhaul or a different role in the narrative. Her femininity leads to her being dismissed by, I think, a lot of modern adaptations, which I think is a tragedy because I think that exploring the seduction, and I put seduction in air quotes because in Dracula, all vampire interactions are non-consensual, just like very clearly. As I've said before, all vampire relationships are dubious consent, but Dracula is explicitly like, this is not consensual in any, in any way. But I think the seduction between Dracula and Lucy is more interesting than breaking up Mina and Jonathan. There is this Darla Drusilla aspect to Lucy. Drusilla is a character who appears in Buffy and she, before she was transformed into a vampire, was this pure innocent woman. And after becoming a vampire, she is like one of the baddest bitches in the world. And you see a lot with like evil female vampires, this idea that they were these innocent women and then because of their transformation were subdued into darkness and I think that's worth exploring what happens to the soul when it's destroyed how does Lucy view herself why is Dracula determined to have her because he actively seeks out Lucy despite it becoming more and more difficult and I think rather than explore that writers would rather just pick Mina because the illusion of innocence is somehow more interesting than the actual innocence on the page. I think people don't trust Lucy's innocence because she seems non-heteronormative in certain ways. And uh, I hate it. Drink my blood. No, I cannot take your life. My life is lost already. There are a lot of adaptations of Dracula and frankly, I didn't feel like watching all of them, but I did watch an assortment to get a variety. And I didn't go through every adaptation. So if you have any examples of significant Minas that you think are really interesting or like Mina type characters, please let me know down below. I would love to hear more about this. But I think the biggest thing you will see about Dracula and adaptation is that they ramp up the sexual aspect a bajillion fold, right? Which makes sense. The book has very erotic moments. There's a lot of homoeroticism in it that is really key, especially like between Dracula and Jonathan. But Dracula himself 
is not a seductive, handsome creature. Even when he gets his glow up after a while, he's not going from like Al Pacino now to Al Pacino in Cruising. He's kind of going from like old meh to less old meh. And I think a big thing to understand about Dracula is that it's really filled with a lot of Eastern European xenophobia that is very much rooted in the way that Dracula is written. There's a lot of of its time shade throughout the book about Dracula's foreignness and how it makes him less of a gentleman. If you read something like the Norton Critical Anthology, a lot of the footnotes are explaining a lot of the subtext that Stoker is putting about class and race into it. And you know, it's got a lot of horrible depictions of the Romani people. It's like, the book is very racist <laughs> it's very racist there's even a line where i think lucy says like she can relate to desdemona being told sweet things even if it's by a black man i was like Ugh. my fave is problematic it happened to me finally. You can even read Dracula's coming to London and seducing fine gentlemen and women as a xenophobic anxiety about foreigners. Foreigners coming and seducing their women, turning them from proper English roses to sensual, big, titty, red-lipped baby eaters. And I'm not talking about swallowers neither. Boo, 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 boo. We even see this in... <laughs> Anyway, uh, we even see this in the way that Dracula has become superimposed to the historical figure of Vlad Tepes, except for that one time in Dracula 2000 where he was Judas Iscariot. Destiny to betray you. Because you needed me. Vlad II Dracula was the medieval ruler of Wallachia, which is in modern day Romania. He and his family were part of this crusader style army that was sworn to defend the nation against the Ottoman Turks and he would implement impalement as his preferred method of execution, which is why he became known as Vlad the Impaler. And despite being a recent You're Wrong About guest, plug, 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 plug in the description, I'm not going to get into the discourse about whether or not he was really as horrible as he has come to be known. Although I think it's a really interesting topic. You know, the person who ended up overthrowing and imprisoning him is the one who ruined his reputation, but also he wasn't really that well known for a long period until Dracula really blew up. So there's a lot of historical stuff to get into. It's like a whole Elizabeth Bathory situation where it's like, did she really kill all those women or was it propaganda? We may never fully know, but it is interesting to think about about somewhere else. What does matter is that being from Eastern Europe and on the wrong side of the Caucasus Mountains, Dracula is seen as an extension of the wrong kind of whiteness that could be brought into the British Empire. Eastern depravity coming West. Speaking of, do you ever think about how like calling white people Caucasian because of the Caucasus Mountains, like doesn't really make a lot of sense because a lot of the people that are there are swarthier and have a different kind of ethnic identity than a lot of the Western white people that we would think of as like traditionally Caucasian and it kind of feels like, you know, that some random German kind of homogenized all Europeans into the whitest version of themselves. But anyway, I mean, what do you expect from the creator of Negroid? But I think despite him being the titular character, something that's really important to kind of get about Dracula is that he is not the main character of the story. But because he is the villain and because of the way that vampires have exploded in popularity in pop culture, he becomes the one we want to see. If you look at works like Bram Stoker's Dracula by Sofia Coppola's father, the Dracula miniseries starring Henry VIII, Dracula Untold, we will see the ways in which Dracula becomes a romantic and tragic figure, which is usually done by making Mina, his long lost love, to add some more stakes. Meanwhile, Inuyasha is the reason why I hate this kind of storylines because I'm Team Kikyo. Team Kikyo, I love you. The reason why Dracula's plans don't work in the book, for those who never read it but somehow sat through all this video congratulations uh the reason why dracula's plan doesn't work to take over all of london and spread his vampirism like a, a disease is because one of lucy's potential suitors john stewart knows van helsing the only person in the story who actually knows what vampirism is dracula as a character has no significant attachment to the larger cast and making him have a relationship with mina or any woman adds an attachment to the larger story it gives him a reason to be with them because in the book, as soon as his plans start to go awry, he's like, well, I'm just fucking leaving. They make it Mina because they can't do it to Lucy because she's either marked for death or sometimes a lesbian. Why didn't you tell me? Tell you what? That it's perfectly natural for a woman to fall in love with another woman. 
And so they just decide that like, hmm, women like bad boy, Dracula bad boy, therefore, hmm? Huh? And again, I don't dislike it, but I feel like it's handled in a way that's really bad for Mina. And I think the best way to explain kind of the issues that kind of exist within the whole Dracula, Mina, Jonathan is to compare it to what I think it's its most natural equivalents. Scott, Jean and Logan from X-Men. All right, hear me out. Hear me out. When I was growing up, I got into X-Men through the 90s television show and the movies, which hype up Logan as Wolverine a lot. And especially play up the love triangle between him and Scott Summers over Jean Grey. You know, Logan is like the alpha hot dude to like Scott's Boy Scout. Logan rebels and Scott bows down to authority. That's the vibe you get. And it doesn't help that for a lot of the time when I was, you know, starting X-Men, it was the period where a lot of X-Men writers really hated Scott. And they were just like, let's just make Scott a fascist for fun. It's a, it's a deconstruction of the character. And it's like, no, it's not. But that was my image of, of Scott, that he was kind of like even more Boy Scouty than Captain America, that he was like just a do-gooder and a loser and blah, 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 blah. So imagine my surprise when I sit down and actually read the Dark Phoenix Saga, the giant omnibus that I, that I own. And Scott is like a solid dude who loves Jean pushes back against Xavier, is a good leader, and the storyline being disillusioned with his mentor. And his relationship with Jean is solid, loving, equal, and oh, everyone hates Wolverine because he's annoying as fuck and aggressive for no reason. And yet, <laughs> and yet, when they look to add sex to the series through Dracula, they do it through Dracula because Dracula is the one selling the records. And there's also this desire to play around with Victorian sensibilities and stereotypes that will default to making Jonathan the stuffy Victorian man. However, in the books, much like Scott Summers in the comics, the good ones anyway, Jonathan is a good fucking dude who loves Mina, considers her to be the love of his life, will become a vampire with her if it comes to it, and feels guilt over essentially being assaulted by three vampire women. He is devoted and brave. In many ways, he like starts off as like a sweet summer child and then turns into like monster killing rogue badass like he's like dean from supernatural i'm assuming i've never seen supernatural but i know he's the hot one so rather than having an equal partnership between jonathan and mina who are like the goth novel version of leslie nope and ben wyatt we get a lot of really weird shit but thankfully due to Dracula Daily and that whole experience, there are more people who understand how great Jonathan and Mina are especially, but the adaptations so far have not really highlighted that at all. It's kind of all uh, the same. Also due to the slutty Lucy innocent Mina dynamic that has emerged, has largely ignored that Mina is the one who isn't a virgin because she's married, which means she had lawfully wedlocked sex. And the reason why I was inspired to make this video was really after watching 1992's Bram Stoker's Dracula. And for me, the hardest thing to deal with was Dracula is responsible for Lucy's death. And from the subtext of specifically even this scene, we can go so far to say that not only did he kill Lucy in the sense that he turned into a vampire, but he also assaulted her. In fact, Dracula feeding off of Lucy while knowing that she has a connection to Mina doesn't make sense at all if they're supposed to be together anyway. Way. But due to this lore from reincarnation, Mina is drawn to Dracula, even though he has her best friend, murdered her best friend, and tortured the man that she's in love with. And for what? If she's not the reincarnated love of Dracula's life, what is the what does he do that makes her want him? You She don't love herself. If we compare this to say Phantom of the Opera, which I know is what you thought I was going to compare it to earlier, Eric is a character with pathos. Yes, he is a walking red flag, but he has feelings. He's an artist. And even though, yes, he does kill people, he does some blackmailing. We're not saying that felonies weren't committed, but at the end of the story, we also see that he learns that love isn't what? Selfish. Ultimate monster fucker villain thing. You have to be able to let Bay go. In the case of Dracula, Mina don't know that man. Not to mention the two most important people of her life suffer horribly 
because of him. So what does it say about her that she would choose Dracula at all? He's not even, he not even, he's not even really rich guys. He's his own servant. That you're not even going to go to Transylvania and have bundles. You're just going to be there in dust. Ugh. Jonathan is not only a good partner in like a dull way, but he's doing action stuff. He's a vampire hunter. He loves his wife. Every entry after he like returns from like, even though he's dead is him going like, I'm going to murder Dracula and bathe in his blood. And also, have you met my beautiful wife, Mina? I love her so much. She's so smart. She's so funny. She loves trains. I love trains. We love train schedules. He's a wife guy. He's a wife guy who murders vampires. That's what we want. After Mina is attacked and begins to start turning, Jonathan writes in his diary, quote, to one thing I have made up my mind, if we find out that Mina must be a vampire in the end, then she shall not go into that unknown and terrible land alone. I suppose it is thus that in old times, one vampire met many, just as their hideous bodies could only rest in sacred earth. So the holiest love was the recruiting sergeant for their ghostly ranks. Bars. Hello? Dracula ain't giving you that. Adrafting Mina and Dracula is overall done, in my opinion, for superficial reasons. Because it doesn't actually allow Mina to explore her sexuality. It assumes that she has none and the adaptation is granting her one. When that couldn't be further from the truth, it treats love in a very shallow way that is upsetting to realize when you read it in the book and you realize that love is at the cornerstone of what makes Dracula work. Like love is Dracula and trains. It's trains in love. It's a massive polycule of mourning bisexuals that come together to avenge their collective girlfriend bestie and the focus is on the least important part because Dracula may be the titular character but you know what? Dracula is a loser, okay? He's a loser who can't drive. Um, yeah. This boy will someday know what a brave and gallant woman his mother is. Already he knows her sweetness and loving care. Later on, he will understand how some men loved her, that they did dare much for her sake. I love Mina. I love Lucy. They should be the main characters in the next adaptation of Dracula. I would go so far as to say that they should do kind of like an OG Nightmare on Elm Street thing and have Lucy be the protagonist until she dies and it switches to Mina. What's been interesting about me revisiting Dracula after watching the 1992 film is that Dracula is such a human driven story that it's sometimes overwhelming how unnecessary the humans have become. Sans like Van Helsing, Mina becoming an extension of like male ideas about Victorian women in whatever form they imagine they take is really frustrating. As in to say that like women aren't also interested in the whole Mina Dracula dynamic inherently. Like, of course we are. We we get it like I get it it's a thing and I think that like many stuff it's something that has been done better in fan fiction and like fan stuff but I think it's really interesting that in order to make that relationship work and how they've done it so far is to remove all the values and aspects that make Mina a good person and a good character like they can't explore her sexuality with people she actually likes. So her attachment to Dracula is fundamentally not an exploration of sexual knowledge or power. It is her becoming a morality pet to make the villain more interesting. And that's a pity because that only shows how little Mina matters in these adaptations and these stories. And I think maybe it's time to shift the focus away from the titular vampire and back to the human element that actually makes the story interesting. And you know, if she's gonna have a hot vampire boyfriend, then she should have a hot vampire boyfriend, not a broke vampire. He spent all his money buying infrastructure in London and he just leaves. He don't even have no follow through. Like he literally isn't like, when he realizes that he's not gonna lose, he's not gonna win, he just leaves. That's loser behavior. Loser, loser, double loser. Get the picture, get the picture, whatever, duh. I'm done. <laughs> If there is any lesson that you can take from Dracula, it is that knowing how to journal properly is super important. If you don't know those train schedules, how can you save London from the undead? Think about it. For me, knowing how to balance everything and keeping track of projects is really hard. But since I've been bullet journaling, it has been helping me so much about at least getting the basic ideas out. When I'm able to rough out a story idea early and if they grow past what I've outlined, that's even better. As for time management, since I am doing YouTube, working on a book and doing a part-time job, just coming up with ways of managing my time, figuring out when to block out stuff, and also reminding myself that it is important 
to breathe. These two classes, Bullet Journaling Life Management for Creatives and Make Your Art Time Management for Creatives, were really good for me in the past month of helping me organize my thoughts, organizing my ideas, and figure out how to take the ideas in my head put them on paper and then implement them so that you could actually enjoy the content. The first 500 people to use my link will get access to one of Skillshare's best offers, 30 days free and 40% off your first year of Skillshare membership. Thanks to Skillshare for helping me become a little bit better at being human one day at a time.